Good afternoon, CS1. How are you guys doing today? <laughs> okay, fantastic. I'm glad to hear it. Uh, uh, we have ourselves an exciting class. We're going to be talking about deep learning. There is no word of the day, um, and that kind of reflects the point that we're at a very interesting part of the class where we have covered a lot of the core material. We're going to be talking about uh, fairness and ethics on Friday, uh, and that is something that you'll need for your problem sets. Uh, but the position that I encourage for you for today is a little bit more of a positioning of wonder than like a positioning of, I must memorize every single detail here. Because this is a story that's unfolding in real time, uh, and it's also one that I think taking a step back and getting the big picture is what's really critical here. Now, having said that, we have an exciting class where we are going to go into the details of what is the mystery behind deep learning. We've heard so much about it, and today in class, uh, you get to learn how that works. Uh, do, 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 do. Now, deep learning is a tool, but the effects of the tool you've probably heard about and you've started to see uh, in your life and in uh, news around you. So, a bunch of results recently have been pretty impressive. Uh, as you might have heard, computers were getting better and better at board games, but there's this one board game that computers could never play because it was thought to be so complicated you needed human creativity in order to play it. And it's this game of Go. And Go is complicated because you know it has a board that's 17 by 17. Every, every square can have a white dot, a black dot, or no dots. And this just becomes so exponentially large that traditional compute power isn't so helpful for being able to solve it. Uh, but then a team called, um, or a team in the United Kingdom came up with an algorithm that was able to beat the world champion at this game. And this was perhaps the last standing board game. Uh, computers got really good at making art. It started out a little bit uh, modestly, computers doing these things called deep dreaming. Uh, it then transformed into computers could recreate the styles of specific artwork like this. Picture might look like it's by Rembrandt, but it's not actually. It's been created by a computer. Uh, and if you guys have been paying attention recently, you realize that you can now open a thing called stable diffusion. And you can say, write a text, and the computer will generate artwork based off the text that you've used. Uh, very controversial, uh, but certainly also very powerful. Uh, and there are other narratives that are perhaps more inspiring, like for example, algorithms that can look at this photo of someone's skin and at the end decide that this is, in fact, something that looks cancerous. So if you're far from a hospital, if you took a photo of this skin, you put it through the algorithm, it says this is cancerous, maybe you know, I need to go to hospital right now. Uh, and that seems like quite an inspiring use. And the crazy thing about all of these examples is that they're using the exact same technology, which is what we're going to be learning today. Uh, and just as a little bit of a warm up, I want to start today by training a little critter. Everybody, this is gonna be our little critter for class. Uh, the little critter is trying to learn how to eat red dots and not to eat uh, green dots. And this little critter is going to have a small little deep learning algorithm. At first, our little critter is gonna act pretty randomly, but I'm just gonna let this guy train throughout class. And by the end of class, we'll be able to talk a little bit more about how this little critter is working and gaining intelligence. So this is gonna be exciting. Certainly, this is a journey we should go on, and in order to go on this journey, let's make sure we bring everyone along, which means starting with a little bit of review. In CS109, we've been learning about machine learning, particularly we've been learning about classification tasks. Classification tasks are ones where you're given a training data set, and based on that training data set, you're gonna build a machine that can take inputs and learn to predict outputs, and the outputs are always labels uh, in our problem sets that are either zero or one. And the fact that these outputs are discrete is what makes something a classification task. The idea is you're gonna use that training data set and you're gonna build a little black box. And that little black box is gonna be governed by these special numbers that we call parameters. And the metaphor we've been using in CS19 for parameters are sliders. So once you build this little black box, you should be able to put in a new set of inputs. So maybe different regions of someone's heart, you know, like you'll give me all of these inputs and the machinery will then be able to predict an output. That output we call uh, y, and sometimes we think of the probability of it as y hat. An important thing is, if you ever want to deploy one of these models, you want to be able to make sure that it works beforehand. So one thing that's worth noting and is relevant to your homework is, instead of just thinking about all your data set as one piece, we often take your data set and split it 
and we'll take some set of our data set and call it training. That's where you'll learn your parameters. And then once you've built your black box based off the parameters learned from this part of the data set, we reserve some of your data set for making sure that the algorithm's working. So we'll have a little test data set, we'll evaluate how well the algorithm works, and if it seems to be doing well enough and it seems to be acting fairly, then we might consider deploying it. Okay, questions? Feel free to just jump in. I have enough mandarins for uh, a whole bunch of questions today. Now, there's a whole bunch of ways you could approach this problem. We learned about naive Bayes first, but then on Monday's class, we learned about logistic regression. That's really where we're going to be picking off today. Logistic regression is one version of that black box algorithm. And if you were to look behind the scenes for the black box algorithm, it would look something like this. You take your inputs, every input gets weighted. We sum up those weighted inputs. We then have to squash the sum. We interpret the squash as a probability that the output takes on the value one. And then based on that probability, we make our classification prediction. This is really what it looks, this is the mental model you should have, but mathematically it's doing this. You know, this is the weighted sum. This is the squashing function, the sigmoid function, not to be confused with the sigmoid from a Gaussian. Uh, and then at the end of the day, it gives you the probability that y equals one. It's not a true model of the world. Like nothing about the world works like this. It is a model that is useful because it ends up making good predictions in general, but this whole machinery is a little bit imagined. Uh, and so even though it's wrong and it's not capturing the way the world really works, it ends up with a very useful machine. Okay, and that is our review. Now it's time to take a journey from the mathematics that we have for logistic regression and get all the way to how could we use this for skin cancer detection. I really like this idea, by the way, of thinking about logistic regression as being Harry Potter's sorting hat. You know, you're gonna take some input uh, and then you're going to make your prediction. It's like the Harry Potter sorting hat looks at the input and says, ah, this is a one, or ah, this is a zero. And the beautiful thing about CS109 is, uh, while you might have read the Harry Potter books and figured that the Harry Potter sorting hat was interesting, CS109, you can learn how it actually could work. Uh, so how the Harry Potter sorting hat could work is just logistic regression, perhaps. But you imagine that might not be powerful enough. Um, okay, just to be clear, inputs, in the case of your problem set, Sometimes it'll be things like movies that a person liked. Uh, and so the inputs, you know, each input index would correspond to a particular movie. When you have a particular user, they'll either like or dislike those movies. Uh, then you weight them, sum them, and it will end up producing your prediction. The intelligence comes from the weights, good weights, and you make good predictions, uh, random weights, and you don't make good predictions. So that was a theory, and that theory though, led us to this wonderful set of mathematics. And this wonderful set of mathematics says, okay, where are we gonna get smart weights from? We need smart weights, where do they come from? Well, first, let's write down the logistic regression model. Based off that logistic regression model, we can say, for any one data point, based on the current values of thetas, how likely is that data point? And this looked really complicated, but recall, this was just the log likelihood of a Bernoulli. And because basically we interpreted the output, this thing, as the p parameter of a Bernoulli, this is just a Bernoulli where instead of the p parameter, you put in the output of your logistic regression. This log likelihood, it's a scoring function. It says, hey, how good are your current parameters? Great parameters will get a really high value on this score. Awful parameters get a very low value on this score. A scoring function is helpful, but it doesn't tell you how to get smart parameters. In order to do that, you need a derivative. So derive your scoring function with respect to every single parameter. And once you do that, you can do hill climbing. Now, we have a particular equation or uh, algorithm for hill climbing that we use uh, in CS109, which is gradient ascent. Uh, and in gradient ascent, you're going to have a system for learning all your parameters. We talked about this on Monday, but it, you start with random settings to parameters, and then over time, you improve each parameter based off of calculating its gradient, and then taking a very small step in this direction of the gradient for each of your J parameters. Okay, and the idea of this gradient ascent is, if you know the derivative of your scoring function with respect to each parameter, and if you keep going uphill, as you keep training, 
you'll get higher and higher scores. And higher and higher scores, we think, lead to smarter and smarter models. Okay, before I move on to artificial neurons, let me just stop here and give you guys a second to talk about this with the person next to you. Summarize what you've learned and see if you can come up with a good question. Uh, take a minute and then we're going to jump into deep learning because this is our launching spot. Okay, go for it. Have a good little conversation with the person next to you. As I said, you know, high level perspective, but this would be a great time for, for clarification questions. If you found something confusing, certainly other people in the class found it confusing too. So what's confusing about this? What's interesting? What's curious? Yes? Can you just like, elaborate on why like, logistic regression might be like, different and why you want to be different? Such a good question. Okay, so at this point in class, we have two totally different algorithms for making predictions for classification tasks. We have logistic regression and naive Bayes. Uh, and let me tell you something very interesting. They're quite similar. You know, they have a lot in common. Uh, they have the same level of complexity. They have similar number of parameters. So for similar problems, they will both perform pretty similarly. The question was, when would you choose one or the other? I'd say if, for example, the ones you have in your problem sets, it would be acceptable to go with either. So that's my first answer is like for lots of similar problems, either one will be just fine. They're different, but they're similar in their effectiveness. That's my first answer. It's kind of lame. The second answer is you could try both. If you had a problem, you could run logistic regression, you could run naive Bayes and see which one's doing better on the testing data set. And you say like, that's the one I want to go with. Uh, and then there is another example which, or answer, which is all of our examples in CS109 have binary inputs and binary outputs. And if you were to change that, you say like your inputs would become real valued or your outputs become something like multi-class. Uh, it turns out inputs becoming real valued, logistic regression handles that much more naturally and outputs being multi-class, it turns out naive base handles that much more naturally. So three separate answers, but maybe the most satisfying is just try both of them, whichever one works best. That's your model. Just to clarify that, I'm not sure if this is what we that. but I think I understand how there's different uses of it. I'm wondering like how the actual process is different. I know that, for example, the main point of uh, naive Bayes was that yes. we're gonna like see which probability is this bigger. We're gonna choose that one. Yes. In logistic regression, what exactly is different about like the same one and adding it up? That makes sense. Like, why the process is different? Yeah, or, it's like the. The sigmoid doesn't even exist in naive base, right? Like naive base sees no sigmoid because it, it's not trying to directly model the probability of y given x. Naive Bayes is trying to you know, use Bayesian calculations to get that. Now, of course, that's almost impossible. So we have to make the naive assumption. So there's like, it's like, I'm going to approach this just using pure Bayesian thinking. I get to some point where it's impossible. I make a big assumption uh, and that big assumption leads to a classification algorithm. Logistic regression has a different path. It says, I'm not even going to try and use Bayes. I'm not even going to try and use core ideas of 
probability. Instead, I'm going to build a probability machine. And this probability machine has nothing to do with Bayes, nothing to do with how probabilities actually work. It's just going to be like a little machine that you stuff in X's and you get probabilities out. And it's going to use this sigmoid mechanism. So they're pretty different paths, uh, but they lead to, they both lead to the same functionality of I will make a prediction. Yes. I don't fully really understand is why we take log with respect to thetas plural and not just theta. Because when we did the algorithm in the problem set last week, where we tried to find the optimization, we just took one derivative. Yeah, good question. So you didn't mean logs, you meant derivatives, I believe. Yes, okay, so the great question was, why do you have to do the derivative with respect to every single theta? That's actually, if you want to do optimization over parameters, you need every partial derivative of all the movable pieces. That's, hill climbing needs all of those partial derivatives. It's not enough to just say, if I were to change theta zero, how would my score change? I have to think about every single theta, and if I were to change them, how would my score change? Uh, and that's the necessary component for getting to hill climbing, aka gradient ascent. So gradient ascent wants to know for every single parameter, if I were to change it, how would the score change? So we need lots more partial derivatives. Earlier in class, we'd only have single parameters. We did some assignments in when we looked at uh, maximum likelihood estimation, where you'd have a model with only one theta, or only one parameter. In that case, you only need one partial derivative. Such a good question, yes. Um, if the data is convex, is there a functional difference between gradient descent and um, like setting all the partial derivatives equal to zero? Uh, okay, good question. If it's convex, would you get different answers if you did gradient ascent versus if you uh, set the derivative equal to zero? First of all, I'd encourage you to try setting this equal to zero and solving for it. It turns out to be very, very, very difficult because of this sigmoid. Uh, having said that, if you were able to come up with an answer, they would be the same. Now, there's a good reason we do gradient ascent, because when we get to deep learning, setting, taking a derivative, setting it to zero, as a method of optimization will not work. We are going to need this powerful tool of gradient ascent. Okay, oh, such good questions. Okay, one more. Um, so for logistic regression, like we mentioned last class, um, it gets its intelligence from maximum likelihood estimation, which is basically just optimizing parameters that we use. Yes. And for that, um, we need to, you know, at some point or another, pick a step size uh, to perform gradient ascent. So yes. I was just wondering, is there some way of methodically picking a good step size, or is there some sort of convention for us to use that sort of like strikes a good balance between running time and accuracy, or, or is it just purely an arbitrary choice? Oh my god, I love, I love it. So there's this big mystery over the step size, and the step size, we use this little symbol for step size, and here we can have like super small and really large. If you have really large step sizes, imagine you're trying to get to the top of this hill and you have huge step sizes. You know, there is this problem that like, if you're here and your step size is huge and you go there, and if your next step size is huge, you could like end up bouncing back and forth over the top of the mountain. You could never reach the top because your step sizes are too big. Imagine somebody climbing a mountain instead of taking small steps, they're just leaping and they just keep leaping over the top. So if you have really large uh, step sizes, you kind of hit this problem that you won't actually converge. Just like this marker is not converging. So over here you have like, doesn't converge. So when you choose a step size, you might start with a large number and then you might run it and it might just never end up getting to a point where gradients are zero. Um, if you have a super tiny step size, you're gonna avoid that problem entirely. Like if you're trying to get to the top of the mountain, take a really small step size, you'll get there. But as you said, yeah, if we have like runtime, like this is gonna be really long. And like as you get to smaller step sizes, you'll be able to converge quicker. We used to talk a lot about like the, the craft of deep learning. And a lot of the craft of deep learning were things like, how do you choose good step sizes? You know, you could do something like, start with a pretty medium sized one, uh, see if you're in this uh, territory, um, and if you are, then just make it a little bit smaller. Now, people have gotten more intelligent. There are things like adaptive gradients where the computer is control of the step size, uh, and it's choosing at each step, 
at each point what step size to do. That you'll learn about in further courses. So there's more sophisticated techniques. And there's the lay of the land. Good question. And there's another one. That's what I was kind of going to ask about. It's like that there seems to be parameters that aren't just like you know, within theta, like step size or by like the bias, like like theta zero. Like um, and like are those things all also like can you do like a likelihood function on those? Okay, so the, the, you bring up a good point. So there seems to be other parameters, and particularly the step size is a good example of that. Theta zero actually is a traditional parameter. We think of it as a parameter, and we're going to have a derivative, and we're going to be doing our likelihood on, um, you know, it goes into the likelihood function. Whereas step size doesn't show up in the likelihood function. And so this sort of parameter gets a special name. It's not just a parameter, it's a hyperparameter. <laughs> like it's super excitable. Um, and that's just to be like, there's some parameters that we're not going to try and learn. Instead, we're going to set them ourselves, uh, step size being one of them. And as I said, in CS109, we just give you some step sizes. They work pretty well. You can play around with them. Uh, and in further classes, you can learn really cool ways of making those intelligent, or making decisions, intelligent decisions about those. OK, yes? Um, the view parameter is 0. Does that mean we're like disregarding that data point because we're saying this is Yes. Like it's not important to come back in the result. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Uh, and your thetas can then become positive or they can become negative. And if it's positive, saying like, you know, this one is going to be shifting my probability positively or, you know, to be more likely. And if it's negative, saying this data point's making me think the probability is smaller. So there you go. You can have zero, you can have positive, you can negative for thetas. Okay, and then you can put it through hill climbing and you get to a point. Fantastic. There's such a simple idea behind deep learning. It's amazing how close you are. The simple idea about deep learning is, hey, you know that logistic regression that we just spent a lot of time talking about? That logistic regression is like a cartoon model of how a human neuron works. Now, if you haven't studied neuroscience, that's totally fine. I'm not going to give you a really detailed idea of how a neuron works, but I'm gonna give you a cartoon model. So in a cartoon model, your brain is filled with these things called neurons. Did you know that? <laughs> and neurons have inputs, often from other neurons, but they could be from things like uh, the retina, which is getting light input. Uh, so it has all these inputs that come into any neuron cell. And for those inputs, some of those inputs will be super important. Like if this neuron gets an input from this particular input, it's definitely going to fire. So the neuron gets all these inputs. If the charge builds up high enough, the neuron then fires, and then any other neuron it's connected to will then get its input. So one of the ideas somebody had is, hey, this logistic regression looks a lot like a cartoon model of what's going on in our brains. But imagine you tried to learn to do a task, and you only were given one human neuron. It seems unlikely that one human neuron could become very smart. Uh, instead, if you wanted to do a task, you might want to think about having a whole brain. And a brain, you can think of it as being a network of neurons where the, this neuron would then connect to other neurons and this whole network of neurons would then be able to output predictions. So the simple idea is, what if we just took a bunch of these logistic regressions? Think about every single logistic regression as like one tiny little Lego piece. And we can start t stacking these Lego pieces on top of each other. And that's a simple idea. So what you learned on Monday was that core unit, and once you start putting those units together, you get what we call a neural network, AKA deep learning. The term deep comes from that you have depth in your layers of logistic regressions. And that's the core idea behind the revolution AI. We could just walk out and be like, now you know deep learning. But of course that's unsatisfying. Can I give you guys a little bit more details? Um, Okay, anyways, this is the idea that leads to AlphaGo, self-driving cars, computer making art. And at its core, deep learning is just many logistic regressions pieced on top of each other. Can I give you guys an example to show you this a little bit in more detail? I'm gonna use this running example of computer vision. Computer vision is the hard task of looking at an image and deciding what's in it. So you guys are very smart humans. Uh, what's in this image? Yeah, it's a hand-drawn zero, but if you had to predict a zero or one, you would say zero. And how about this image? 
ah, oh, such smart humans we are. We have huge neural networks that are helping us with this prediction. Actually, it is very misleading because you have billions of neurons helping you make that decision. So your brain actually starts with a very complicated representation. When you see this, it's hitting the back of your eyeball, a thing called the retina, and the retina is you know, seeing amounts of light that hit different parts. Another way of thinking about this is a very similar analogy is what the computer sees. The computer doesn't see a picture of a zero. Instead, it sees a whole bunch of pixels, which either could be black or white. And that whole bunch of pixels to it just looks like a list or a grid of zeros and ones. Same thing with your brain. When you first see this image, it's a whole bunch of light responses on the back of an eye. It doesn't have meaning. Computer vision is the particular type of neural network that could take an image and then make a prediction. And, you know, just to be clear, the reason that you find this easy is you have hundreds of millions of neurons. In fact, visual neurons make up about 30% of your brain. So when we look at this problem, you're going to think of all these tasks as quite easy, but that's because you have such an impressive neural network. And actually, a fun thing is the first layer of your neural network actually happens in the back of your head, which is not that important right now. Imagine you had to do this task, and I just gave you a single logistic regression unit. It would be really difficult. The X's, the features in this case, will correspond to each different pixel in the image. If you took a particular image, that would tur turn on all the X vectors. And then you could have a logistic regression that could weight each of those, sum it, squash it, and then make a prediction. But this would be a little bit similar to asking a single neuron to learn how to see. You have 30% of your brain to see. It seems unreasonable that a single logistic regression could possibly find good thetas. You're like, can't we just use gradient ascent and they'll just get better and better and better? And the answer is no, this model of logistic regression is just too far, it's too puny to tackle such a large task. There's not enough parameters. So even though you can have a great optimization algorithm, we can write a likelihood function, we can try and optimize it. There's no set of parameters that will start to do a good task or a good job at this task. Anything confusing about that? Interesting, curious? Yes. Can you, can you kind of go over again, like what differentiates this from like, um, a movie sort of thing, like being able to like tell like if you like a movie or not, like why is this not doable? You know, one way, so the question is, why is this not doable, but the movie thing was doable? It's a good question. Um, part of it is that the task is harder. Part of it is think about the number of inputs. Like how many pixels do you have here? And the number of inputs is really, 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 really large. Uh, and the combination of those inputs that leads to your prediction is very complicated. So you have a huge dimension for x. And what makes for a y, the true methodology for deciding if this is a 0 or 1, is very complicated. You know, it's not just is there a white here, because you know, the white could be over here when you draw your 0. Whereas for if this was a particular movie, it's much easier because it doesn't change so much. Like if somebody likes this movie, then it has a very consistent impact on whether or not they like your target movie. So two answers. One is much higher dimension. The second is much more complicated interaction between the inputs to making the output. So the dimension part can be taken by computing power, right? Yes, it could be fixed with more computing power, but the other part can't be. Yes, fantastic question. Yes. Do we understand exactly why it becomes really powerful to stack these up, or did we just kind of do it and realize it? Yeah, there's some people who would say they have some guesses, but you're not completely wrong in that we did it, it seemed kind of like a cartoon model of the brain, and then it worked, and then we started analyzing it. Uh, but now that we've analyzed it, there are some cool theories that say like, oh, you can learn nonlinear functions, uh, there's actually no limit to the functions you could learn, uh, and people are still trying to tell more and more nuanced stories for why this works. But your insight was correct. People basically just tried this. Wait, can I tell you a hilarious thing? Somebody proposed this and they tried it and it didn't work because their computers were too puny. And then no one researched it for a really long time. And then a couple people were like, hey, computers are really good. Should we try that old idea? And then it worked and they got Turing Awards. <laughs> really? <laughs> uh, all of them. Uh, but anyway, so yeah, it turns out the functionality was really what drove the research. I'm going to start drawing a logistic regression like this, if you guys don't mind. 
Like this is a logistic regression, but now I'm gonna kind of ignore all the middle parts, the squashing or the summing and the squashing. I'm just gonna have an arrow that says, all of these inputs get summed and squashed and they lead to this output. Does that sound reasonable? Okay, now, you know, logistic regression, maybe it could do a good job sometimes, but it's not always going to do a good job. And so the very simple, humble idea that somebody proposed and it didn't work because their computers were too puny and then it was a huge deal later is, what if we had stacks of neural networks? And to be clear, here I'm gonna say, you have your inputs and you have your outputs, but I'm gonna introduce a new thing called a hidden layer. And every single thing in this hidden layer is going to be a logistic regression connected to the inputs. And then once I have this hidden layer, I'll build a logistic regression that takes the hidden layer as its input and then predicts the output. I am going to, uh, just to give you an idea of this, as I said, every single circle in this hidden layer is a logistic regression. It's gonna take every input, weight it in its own way with its own parameters, sum it, squash it, and then it will turn on or off. So this circle represents one logistic regression. But so does that circle. This circle is also logistic regression. It has the same inputs, but it's got its own weights, so it may turn it on or off in a different way. Every single one of these circles is now a logistic regression. So you have a huge amount more parameters. And then finally, if we did this, we'd have a whole bunch of zeros and ones, and that's not a prediction, so we're gonna take all of the outputs of these logistic regressions and call them inputs to a final logistic regression, which is going to predict uh, our zero or one. Cool or what? What a simple idea. If we can understand this, that is, you know, this now counts as deep learning because we have depth of our neurons. You can imagine the depth is that at some point you have a logistic regressions whose inputs were the outputs of other logistic regressions. Okay. There are so many parameters here. You know, if you imagine this final logistic regression, we've got a weighting for every single output. But how about over here? There's a whole bunch of parameters. In fact, I'd encourage you to think about how many parameters there could be. But for now, I'm just gonna say, we have way more parameters than we used to have. Okay. Uh, and just to be clear, you know, what we just described to you is a neural network, many logistics, uh, regressions stacked to each other, uh, and deep learning is the process of maximizing likelihood for a neural network. Uh, and, you know, at this point you can imagine as, it's just like logistic regression, but now your input to output matching is just going to be lots of logistic regressions, lol. Okay, there's a whole slide just for that one awful joke. Can I show you a demonstration? <laughs> I feel like it's cool to talk about it and show it in slide, but like, wouldn't it be great to see a real live neural network? Let me show you one that does this task of predicting zeros and ones. Oh, hey, our critter is still learning this whole time that we've been talking, it's been practicing. Here is a logistic regression, or sorry, a deep learning network, because it's not just one logistic regression. At the bottom here, you're gonna have inputs, and at the top, you're gonna have predictions. I'm gonna hand draw a zero. Uh, here we go. I'm gonna be not great about it. And our network's job is to take all those pixel values and predict if this was a zero or one. And if you look at it, at the very bottom of this neural network, we have a bunch of cells that represent the initial pixel values of what I drew. Does that make sense? Then every single cube here is going to be its own logistic regression. We'll look into those in a little bit, but if you go to the very top, at the very top we have logistic regressions that represent, that have numbers above them. This is a logistic regression that's associated with a zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And do you notice that when I drew that zero, the logistic regression associated with a zero is the one that turned on. So overall, it's taking pixel values and recognizing it's a zero. And if we drew something different, like a seven, you know, it'll take pixel values down here, just what I drew, and then turn on this one cell that represents a seven. Uh, or if I drew, let's say, a one, uh, it could take all these pixel values and then turn on that one cell that represents a one. That's the input and that's the output, but clearly it doesn't just have one logistic regression anymore. We have a whole neural network. So if you look at this final cell up here, it is a logistic regression and its inputs are not coming from the pixels. 
if inputs are coming from all of these other logistic regressions which are turned on in different ways. Uh, and if you looked at any one of them, you can see that any one of these is a logistic regression whose inputs come from this previous layer. We call these things layers uh, of logistic regressions. And if you looked at a different one, like this one turned on, but it had the same inputs as the other one we looked at, it's just probably weighted those inputs differently. So every single cube here is a logistic regression. Uh, and as you get lower and lower, um, you know, there are logistic regressions pulling from different parts of the image. Okay, that's it. That is deep learning. And at this point, because you understand logistic regression, you could just start stacking these things on top of each other and you would have your own neural network. Now, of course, the difficulty will always be, where do you get those thetas from? You imagine if somebody made this neural network and every parameter was random, it wouldn't be able to take pixels and predict what's in the picture all of its intelligence will still be coming from the parameters. So the mystery still will be, I can make a neural network, but how could I learn those parameters? So like, is there any solution to where you start your parameters or do you truly just pick random? You truly pick random. There's one thing that's very different from what you do in your problem sets or logistic regression. In logistic regression, we start all our parameters at zero, but for a neural network, it turns out to be important that you start all of your parameters randomly and that allows the different neurons to learn different things. Um, but no, really, we start random. There's no like smart starting point. It's just starting at random and then hill climb. Of course, we'll get into the details. Yeah, okay, question. So intuitively, like, what are these like cubes in each layer? Every single cube is its own logistic regression. It takes inputs, it weights those inputs, it squashes those inputs, and then it comes up with its own value, which is the squashing of all those inputs, weighted inputs. So every single cube, it is one logistic regression. It will have its own parameters, and then it'll do the summing squashing uh, based on those parameters. Does that answer? Yeah, also like, what are the like combination of those cubes then for each of these like rectangles? Oh, like over here, like these layers? Yeah, so like each layer we have like a bunch of different like rectangles, right? A com combination of different things. Like what are like those? I mean, I call these things layers. When you get deeper in here, we have these kind of grid-like ones. That has, it's a particular way of doing uh, images where we kind of have a few logistic regressions that, as you notice, have smaller number of inputs. Like they just take four inputs. That was a nice little trick for images. Not worth focusing on too much now. We'll talk about that later. Um, but these three layers are, you know, they're not fully connected. It's not that every single cube is taking every single input as an X. That's a nice little design trick. Yeah. Um, so I know you said that the intelligence comes from like the uh, weights, but then also like you have to decide beforehand like how deep are you going to go and within each layer how many. Um, yeah. Be. So how do you decide that? Like, is some intelligence in that too? It's a lot like this. I would call those hyperparameters. So this is a little bit more like the, the art and craft of deep learning, is you construct how many layers. You construct how many neurons per each layer. Uh, maybe there's some like neat little thing you'll do at the beginning so that these neurons have fewer inputs. Uh, all those things are artistic choices, I would say. Of course there was one person who was like, can I have the computer build a neural network that could make those choices for me? And people have definitely done that. Uh, and yet still, I still see a lot of people just being like, we'll make a bunch of neural network, it'll have like, you know, 40 layers, uh, and each layer will have 100 neurons. So artistic choices. Just to ask a question. So if it's artistic, uh, so if you just have to like, you know, uh, practice your own way until your accuracy grows half, I think. Yeah, that, exactly. So if you, you could do something like if you didn't know, you could make two neural networks, train both of them, and then see which one starts to get smarter. And then that's how you could make your artistic choice. Sounds a little more like optimization then. <laughs> um, yeah? Okay, so at this point, I hope you're understanding this big picture that deep learning is a bunch of logistics pointed together. You've visualized it, hopefully you understand it, but I haven't told you where we're going to set all those thetas. I've now exploded our number of thetas without talking about how we're going to set them. And that seems impossible, which leaves us with the final mystery for today. 
How do we train? And you guys are getting that close to understanding deep learning. It is such a simple idea. Logistics on top of each other, but you need to be able to answer this question as well. And the start of this journey is going to be maximum likelihood estimation. We're going to say everything in our neural network is a parameter, and we want to choose the parameters that maximize the likelihood of some training data set. There we go. Okay, first a couple learning goals. Uh, I do want you to walk away from today's class understanding chain rule a little bit better, and understanding how chain rule is the heart and soul of the gaining of intelligence for a neural network, the deep learning. I do want to de demystify deep learning. Like you guys might have heard about deep learning. You might have heard people talk about it like it's some sort of sentient being, but now I want you to understand. No, it's, it's something you could uh, tangibly understand. Uh, and then finally, you know, one of my goals is you walk out today so ready to get the big picture of the logistic regression that you have to do for your problem set. Okay, and now it is time for some math worth learning. We're going to go through the math that is how deep learning gets this intelligence. And this might become something you could expect should become common knowledge. Like as deep learning becomes more and more pervasive, it impacts our lives more and more. Whether or not you build it or you just want to understand this tool that exists in society, we should know this math. Okay, a little bit of new notation. I am going to write it on the board over here so that we can keep track of it over time. I got X, that was our inputs of our little black box. I've still got Y hat, that's our output of our black box, but now I've got a hidden layer H. Uh, and I am going to talk about each of these things as XIs. That's nothing too new. I'm going to refer to each of these neurons in the hidden layer as H. I think I call it J, right? Yeah. So we're gonna call each of these ones HJ. And HJ is going to have a whole bunch of parameters associated with it. And the parameters associated with HJ, I'm going to be calling the thetas. And in superscript, I'm gonna say it's for HJ. And that's gonna tell me that I'm gonna have a bunch more thetas. Oh, sorry, this is thetas for the hidden layer. And particularly for this logistic regression, it's going to have a theta for every single one of the inputs. So this HJ will have a theta for X0, X1, X2, X3. Does that make sense? So HJ, it's going to have a theta for theta zero. It'll have a theta for theta one. It'll have a theta for theta two, a theta for theta, uh, you know, for X3. And so because of that, we're gonna think of Oh, it looks like they're hanging out together. Um, we're going to imagine there's going to be a whole set of parameters for this hidden layer. And for this hidden layer, it will have two different subscripts. It'll say, I have a parameter for, in this hidden layer, every combination of some input and some hidden neuron. Wow, that's a whole bunch of parameters. Every single one of these hidden neurons is a logistic regression. So HJ is gonna be a logistic regression. You guys ready for it? That means it's going to be the squashing function of the weighted sum of two things. One of those things is x. And the other thing is going to be theta, uh, is going to be the theta h's for j. But you know, this sum, this sig, or <laughs> this transpose is the same as saying, okay, we're gonna sum over all the inputs in xi we're gonna take every xi and we're going to weight it. It's gonna be a weight, so it's a theta. It's coming from this hidden layer, so it's gonna have this superscript h. And particularly, this is the one that's going to the j hidden neuron, so it's gonna have a j subscript there. And we're gonna loop over all the inputs uh, and there's gonna be a different theta for every single input here. So, this is my mathematical way of saying every single circle here in this hidden layer is going to be a logistic regression. It's gonna be a logistic regression which has its own weights and there'll be one weight for every input hidden layer combination. If I gave you X's and I gave you all the thetas, you could use this formula to decide if HJ was turned, you know, close to one or not. 
when you actually evaluate this, this will become a number. Okay, that was complicated. Let's take some questions. Yes. So how many betas would there be in, I guess, that example? It's such a good question. I'm going to ask you in just a second, but I'm going to let you guys start thinking about it. You know, like imagine there's uh, 20 or, you know, 40 things here and 10 things here and one thing here. You can start asking yourself, how many thetas are there? But I will ask you in just a second. So think about it for a moment. I do want to introduce just a little bit more notation. And the last piece of notation I'd like to introduce is that all of this just describes the logistic regressions that go from X to H. There's one final logistic regression that takes all of these outputs as inputs and then predicts a Y. And in that final logistic regression, you know, Y hat is the output of a logistic regression. So again, there's a sum. This sum is going to go over and it's going to pull out each of the H's and it's going to weight them. And it'll be another weight. And to distinguish the weights in this part of the neural network from the weights in this part in the neural network, we're going to consider these weights to be theta with Y in the superscript. And that's just so that we can tell apart these weights from these weights. So these are the weights in the H layer, and these are the weights in the Y layer. Okay, and then, you know, here it is on the screen for people who have trouble reading on the board. But I'm gonna keep this on the board the whole class through. Yes? Does that mean every H value is put on every single value of X, and the only standard is the theta value that you choose? What you said was 100% correct. That's awesome. So every single H, gets the exact same set of inputs, and the only thing that's different is that they will have different thetas, so different parameters. Okay, rock and rolling. What I don't understand is you said that the little circle is the, is the, the regression thing. So how is it having thetas if everything's contained within the circle? This little circle, it's gonna be a computation You'll start with the x's and how do you compute the value of this little circle? The way you compute the value of this little circle is you use this formula. So you take all your x's and then you're going to be weighting them by these thetas. These thetas are going to live in the memory of your computer uh, and these thetas are going to tell you how you should be weighting the x's for this particular h. So you weight each of your x's, get that number, throw it through our sigmoid function and that will be hj. If you chose a different h, it would use the same x's, but it would have its own thetas. Again, this would live somewhere in your Python memory. Um, it would pull out those thetas. Uh, it would do the sum, the squash, and it would get its own value. Okay, fantastic. So let's do a forward pass. If we take a picture of a one, we don't have to guess the values of x. We're told what they are. Each value of x corresponds to a pixel value. Like this will be the pixel value in the bottom right corner, and that will be the pixel value in the top left corner. Then, once we have x's, we could calculate every single hidden neuron. We could save every single hidden neuron, calculate yourself based on the x's. In order to do that, they're going to use this formula, which is also over here. <laughs> and this formula is going to take those x's and weight them. Every single thing in the hidden layer has its own set of weights. So they will come up with different answers. Even though they're all taking the same x's, since each one's weighting its own weights, they'll get different answers, and then you'll activate the hidden layer. We call this the forward pass. This is the prediction pass. So we took an image, uh, we activate the hidden layer, and then finally we're going to activate this layer. This layer is going to say, okay, I'm going to take each of these as my inputs. I'm going to weight each of those inputs using the weights that are stored in this part of my Python program, and then I'm going to get that sum, squash it, and I'm going to call that uh, my prediction. Okay. So that's forward pass. If we wanted to get to the point of learning these thetas, it's now time to score our forward pass. So we did our forward pass. How good a job did we do? And the scoring function we want should be derivable with respect to the different thetas. So when we say, how good a job do we do? We don't want to just give us 100% if we got it right or a 0% if we got it wrong. Instead, we'd like to have something that we could learn from. So again, the scoring function we'd like to use at this point is going to be maximum likelihood estimation. We're going to say, hey, you're predicting something binary. And if you're predicting something binary, you could imagine that there is some Bernoulli parameter P. 
you come up, like this very final thing is gonna be interpreted as a probability. So we can call this y hat is like actually a probability. And we're interpreting this very final thing as the probability that the label should be one. We say whether or not the label should be one, it's a Bernoulli. And what came out of your logistic regression was the parameter for that Bernoulli. And we can say how likely is a, a true label of one if your probability was a 0.8. So if your probability is a 0.8, you can say the likelihood here is gonna be 0.8 to the power of one times 0.2 to the power of zero. So 0.8, if you guess, if the true label is a one and your final probability is a 0.8, we can score that. And we score it in the exact same way that we score logistic regression, which I appreciate is complicated, right? We've got this whole like Bernoulli thing. We have this continuous likelihood function. That over there is the log of this continuous likelihood function. So this scoring function is not very good for computers. We want the log version of it. And we end up with this crazy equation. But the high level picture is the same. You know, you could make a prediction, end up with a probability, and I can score that probability using the MLE mindset. Questions, curiosities, concerns? Yeah. Like what's actually in layer H? Is it, an, is it another set of betas per each of the regressions, or is it actually like a zero or one? Both. There will be thetas, and those thetas will lead to actual values. They won't be zero and one because they're coming out of a sigmoid. They'll be something between zero and one. Uh, but they'll be smushed to be close to zeros or ones. And so they're both true. There are thetas, they'll have numbers. There will be activations, like if you put an input, you can activate the hidden layer itself. So there's both a theta, you can think of those as living between the layers, and then there's the layer itself, which will end up getting on, taking on values. Yeah? Can you spoil the probability? Oh, sorry, what was the, I couldn't hear you. Can you spoil the probability? Ah, we score the probability using MLE. So we're going to say, how likely does one data point look like based on this prediction? The data point will have a true label. What's the true label here? So you end up with a probability out here. Let's say it's a 0.8. How do you score the 0.8 if the true label is 1? So y hat is going to be your 0.8, uh, and the true label is going to be y. And so you could put that into this little function here. It's 0.8, put that through a log, times it by 1, because the true label was a 1. Uh, this is going to be times by zero, so we're going to forget that. It'll just be one times log of 0.8 will be your score. So you have these two things, this y hat, which is the probability that you just calculated. And if you had a true label because this is training data, then you can put those two things together into a score. It looks really confusing. I feel like this equation is incredibly confusing for what it really is. It's just taking a probability and scoring it based on the true label. Uh, and it's just using this derivable version of the Bernoulli probability mass function. Insane. But very clever. Good job, whoever figured this out. Okay. Yeah. Is this a sanity check? So I know you just said that layer H is basically a list of like outputs of the sigmoid. Yeah. But wouldn't we need to pass on a list of binary inputs when we do the second round of logistic regression? Ah, what a good question. Do you remember earlier somebody asked me, hey, when would you use logistic regression? When would you use naive Bayes? I threw out a little bit of an interesting comment. I said, hey, if your inputs weren't binary, if your inputs were something like real valued, that's totally fine for logistic regression. It doesn't care. But it totally breaks naive Bayes. It turns out logistic regression doesn't rely on the fact that x's are zeros or ones. Logistic regression is totally fine if those are like 0.7. It's totally fine if those are like, you know, 20. It doesn't even change the probability analysis because the MLE is all just based off of that final output anyways. So there's no probability analysis here. It's just a black box and that black box is totally fine with real valued inputs. Good question, yes? You know what? Logistic regression would just learn different weights okay. and it would probably do better if it had richer inputs. Okay. It's such a good question. I love this. Yes. All right, back to the log likelihood thing. Yeah. Like, if your true value is a number from like 0 to 10, in this case, let's say it's 0 or 1. We're still into the predicting zeros or 1s. Because if it wasn't a 0 or 1, then we couldn't use the Bernoulli 
probably mass function. We'd have to use a different one. I'll talk to you about that at the end of today's class. But actually, yeah, we are just predicting hand-drawn zeros or hand-drawn ones. OK, fantastic. This is a crazy complicated slide. It gets a little bit easier from here. It looks scary at some point, but it's just a ruse. So if you can understand this, you're in a good plot place. OK. Ah, OK, we put it all together, and we start to write neural networks in much more er, compact ways. We've got our x, we've got our h, and we've got our y. Between the x and the h, we have some thetas. Between the h and the y, we've got some more thetas. And then I have this question that somebody asked me earlier, and I was so cheeky, and I said, you figure it out. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. <laughs> so let's say our x is size 40, our h is size 20. In this case, my first question for you is how many parameters are there in this part of the neural network? Why, I'm, after I ask you that, I will ask you how many parameters are there in this part of the neural network. Why don't you talk about with the person next to you, come up with a guess. There's no uh, reason that you should be able to answer this at this point, but if you can, fantastic. Uh, and if not, we'll talk about it. Who thinks it's A? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who thinks it's B? A bunch of folks. Who thinks it's C? Not so many. How about D? A couple folks. OK, fun fact, they're actually all a little bit wrong. <laughs> no, no, they're very close. I would say if I had to choose between these, I'd probably choose B. Because this, this final layer is actually just one logistic regression. And its inputs are the hidden layers. So if there's 20 elements in the hidden layers, it'll have 20 inputs. And each of those inputs need to be weighted exactly once. So it'll need 20 parameters. The reason I say it's slightly wrong is because I think the true answer should be 21. And the reason is we're not going to get too much into this in this lecture. But you know he had that bias term when we did logistic regression. We're still going to keep using those in our neural networks. So there'll be one extra term for a bias. But that's not important right now. You know, Really, the number of things in this y is not too large. How about this one? How many parameters are there in this chunk of the neural network? So this is the part that connects the x's to the h's. Think about it. Think about it. It's time to vote. OK, and imagine there's a plus one to all of these. Who wants to say 800? Bunch of folks. Who wants to say 20? That would be nice. Who wants to say 820? That'd be nice, too. Who wants to say 16,000? Just all the parameters of the will again. <laughs> uh, in this case, there's actually you know, a little bit more than 800. If you forget the bias term, there would be exactly 800. Because every single one of these hidden neurons will have a parameter for every single input. So each of these are going to have 40 parameters, and there's 20 of them. So there's 20 times 40 parameters uh, in this chunk. There'll be a few more once you have bias terms, and 40 times 20 is 800. Oh, my god, my, I got it wrong. It says how many parameters in total? Ha, 800 plus 20 is 820. Man, <laughs> reading comprehension, Chris, tsk, tsk. OK, so there's something like 820 parameters if you have 20 uh, hidden neurons and 40 things in your inputs. All you need in order to train is a partial derivative of that likelihood function for every single one of those 820 parameters. So let's go do 820 partial derivatives. Who's ready? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> let's try and do something brave. Let's talk about how we can get the partial derivatives for all of these 820 parameters that all need setting. And we only have to do three things. We only have to write the likelihood assumption. Or you know, get this likelihood equation. And then once we have that, we just have to derive it with respect to all of the different components. And why do you need this? Because if you want a good neural network, you need good thetas. If you want good thetas, you want to search for ones that maximize likelihood. You can maximize likelihood using optimization, optimization techniques such as gradient ascent. But for gradient ascent, 
you need to have the partial derivatives of the scoring function you have with respect to every single movable part in your model. And all of our movable parts are the thetas. So that is the story, and it basically says, <laughs> Uh, when you guys, actually, I just want to have this meta thing, that understanding MLE applied to deep learning is only hard because there's these four compounded st oh, sorry, steps to get there. So, oh, before we jump into this, I think this is funny. <laughs> you know, like this is a picture of a huge deep learning model and we've got Scooby-Doo saying, hey gang, let's see what deep learning really is, because at the end of the episodes they always reveal. And in this case, Oh my God, it's just convex optimization. It's just a whole bunch of derivatives happening that can make your theta smarter. Okay, let's jump into it. This is exactly the same as logistic regression. Our model is going to eventually output a probability, which we're going to assume is the probability that the class label is one. The probability the class label is zero is gonna be one minus that. That's our assumption is that this model's creating those probabilities. Based off that, we can get a super sweet scoring function. If you had a single data point, the way you could score this is you could use your Bernoulli probability mass function. So y hat is the probability that came out of your neural network. You know, if you want to get really detailed into it, it's coming from this equation, but it is the probability that we're assuming is the probability that y equals one. And because of that, that's the parameter of your Bernoulli. Your data point has a true value y. It'll be the probability raised to the one or zero, which is the true value y. And this is the continuous version. So, great, why is a Bernoulli? We can use that as our likelihood function. If we have many data points in our training example, we're just going to do the product of those many times. So you get a whole bunch of the outputs of my, the output of my logistic regret, or my deep learning for the ith training example raised to its label. Now this is going to be numerically unstable, so instead of maximizing the likelihood, we're gonna maximize the log likelihood, gets the same answer, but it's going to be much easier for our computer friends. So instead of doing this likelihood, we're gonna take the log of it, and we take the log, you get the exact same equation from MLE of logistic regression. Like this is exactly character for character the same. If you have n data points, it has this inner sum for each of those data points, amazing. So, this is the same as logistic regression. This is the same as logistic regression. Uh, finally though, all we have to do is derive this with respect to every single one of our thetas. All the thetas here, all the thetas here. So, you know, we have 800 here and 20 there. We're gonna do that derivative. Now, our goal is the derivative with respect to all of these output parameters and the derivative with respect to all of these hidden parameters. If you can calculate all those partial derivatives as a function, you are done. Here is a bad approach. Let's say you want to calculate the derivative. You're like, I've got this scoring function and I wanna get the derivative with respect to say a theta here. A bad approach would be, you could say, oh, y hat is actually this. This is the equation for how y hat's calculated. So I can just substitute that into my equation. And so instead of having this log likelihood here, you know, I could uh, put that into my equation and then I can keep chaining these as I go. That's would be correct, but will lead to a math bug. Instead, what I'd like to show you guys is derivatives without tiers. How can we derivatives without tiers? Because this is going to be important because deep networks often don't just have one layer. They have multiple layers. So we need to know how to do this calculus without making us want to pull out our hairs. So no tiers calculus. And it comes down to the chain rule. And Mr. Blanton was uh, my high school math teacher and he taught me the chain rule. And I told him I don't think it was gonna be useful and he was right. It was in fact useful and it now governs most of artificial intelligence. Chain rule says if you have a function, you can decompose it using some intermediate step. I find this a little bit abstract, but I find this really easy to understand. You want the derivative of log likelihood with respect to a theta. There is an intermediate result, which is the probability. So get the derivative log likelihood with respect to that probability, and then you can multiply it by the derivative of that probability with respect to the thing that went towards calculating the probability. You can decompose each step in your calculation of log likelihood and get the derivative piece by piece. Also, don't forget sigmoid. We love it because it's got this beautiful derivative. And uh, another thing not to forget, you know, the derivative of the sum is the sum of the derivative. So often from now on, I'll just be thinking about a log likelihood that doesn't have the sum. Because you can do the derivative of this log likelihood without the sum, then you can just put a sum outside and it will be the same. Okay, in Monday's class, when we did 
um, logistic regression, we had this practice thing. We said, what is the derivative of this expression, sigmoid of theta transpose x, uh, where we know that sigmoid has this beautiful slope? We use the chain rule. We said, okay, take that input, call it z, and then we'll get the derivative of sigmoid of z with respect to z and multiply that by the derivative of z with respect to each theta ij. Uh, and when we did all that and plugged and chugged, we ended up with this nice little equation. You can review Monday um, just a little bit of reminder of what we have done. So let's do it. This is Stanford. We can do something brave. Derivative goals. Let's start out with getting this derivative. I want the derivative of this scoring function for one data point with respect to a parameter here in the output layer. Whew. First, we have to decompose it. We want to use the chain rule to say, okay, there's a theta here and there's an output here, but there's this intermediate computation, which is the com computation of the probability. And let's split this up. We say, you know, the li log likelihood comes from this probability, and this probability comes from this theta. And we can do derivatives in two steps using the chain rule. We can find the derivative with respect to y hat, multiply that by the derivative of y hat with respect to this particular parameter. And that's fantastic. What if we wanted to then get the derivative with respect to one of these inner thetas? And this might be the most important slide of today's because this is to show you how chain rule can make it easy to do calculations, derivatives, when you go deeper and deeper. So now we have a scoring function over here, and it is impacted by a parameter over here. How can we figure out, if you were to change a parameter here, how much the scoring function would change, aka the derivative? Again, you could try and write the scoring function in an equation that has this parameter and then do the straight math, but that would not work very well. Instead, you should use the chain rule. And to do the chain rule, you should recognize that this leads to these calculations. These calculations leads to this calculation. This calculation leads to your log likelihood. And the chain rule can allow you to do the derivatives of each of those steps on their own. So the derivative with respect to this thing will become the derivative of log likelihood with respect to your output probability. The derivative of your output probability with respect to your hidden activation and the derivative of your hidden activation with respect to each of these. You can just chain each of these layers together. And you don't have to do one composed derivative, you can do each derivative on its own. Decomposition, what a good time. So, if we want to get that derivative of log likelihood with respect to the output parameter, we'd first need this. The derivative of log likelihood with respect to p, or y hat rather, the probability that comes out of our deep learning algorithm. We know log likelihood is just going to be this Bernoulli probability mass function logged. Uh, and when we do the derivative of this with respect to y hat, it's really not that bad. You know, you have this term, what's this derivative with respect to y hat? Well, that looks like a constant and derivative of log of your variable is just gonna be one of your variable. Something similar happens on this right hand side. We are having a good time. You could simplify this if you wanted to, and you end up with a really nice expression for that first term. Okay, not so bad. That first term, check, done. How about the, this derivative? The derivative of the output of your neural network with respect to one of the hidden parameters. Yee. Don't forget the output is defined in terms of this logistic regression. Uh, you can think of this as sigmoid of z, where z is the inner part that goes into the sigmoid. Uh, and just like we did before, you can say, okay, this derivative of y hat with respect to that parameter uh, is going to be do, 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 do. this derivative over there. Uh, do, 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 do. Oh. <laughs> oh, right, right, right. This is the sigmoid. So the sigmoid's derivative is just the sigmoid itself times 1 minus the sigmoid times the derivative um, of y hat with respect to h of x size, and you get this. But this is the same as what we had for uh, maximum likelihood estimation of logistic regression. You know, this is a very similar formula. You have the output of your logistic regression times one minus the output of your logistic regression times by what used to be xi, but is now hi. Okay, not so bad. And not too scary. And this really comes from the fact that sigmoid has a nice slope. You know, this is the derivative of a sigmoid and so it's just going to be a sigmoid times 1 minus the sigmoid times the derivative of 
uh, do, 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 the inside with respect to the parameter you cared about. And we get with something not so bad. At this point, we figured out the derivative of log likelihood with respect to y hat. We figured out the derivative of y hat with respect to this, and we just multiply those two things together, and you would get the derivative of log likelihood with respect to one of these output parameters. And we're almost done. We've now figured out the derivative with respect to one of these output parameters. Now let's talk about the derivative with respect to one of these input parameters. You don't need to memorize this, but I want to give you the flavor for how chain rule is allowing us to get bigger and bigger networks without the math becoming insane. The way we can get this derivative is just chain rule. You know, get the derivative of this calculation with respect to, the, uh, times it by the derivative of this calculation, and times it by the derivative of this calculation. So you have each of these parts on their own. This derivative we've already done. We already know the derivative of log likelihood with respect to y hat. We haven't done this derivative. What's the derivative of y hat with respect to one of the h's? Okay, you'd have to derive this with respect to one of the h's. Luckily, this is the derivative of a sigmoid. And the sigmoid has this nice derivative where it's just going to be the sigmoid times one minus sigmoid times the derivative of the inside with respect to what you cared about. What's the derivative of this inside with respect to hj? Well, there's only one thing that's multiplied to hj and that's theta j. So this derivative, not so bad. Hey, is it over? Almost, we've got this derivative, we've got the derivative of y hat with respect to hj, and now we just need the derivative of hj with respect to one of the parameters. What's hj? Here you go. We need the derivative of this with respect to one of those thetas. Now, this is a little bit nice because you're doing the derivative of a sigmoid. What's the derivative of the sigmoid? It's just going to be the sigmoid itself times one minus the sigmoid times the derivative of the inner part with respect to what we cared about, in this case, a theta ij. Now, there's only one theta ij, or there's only one number that's multiplied with theta ij. So that's when k equals i, and when k equals i, x also equals i. So there's only one number that's multiplied by theta ij. So we take the derivative of this with respect to theta ij, we just get an xi. And we're done. And you just multiply each of these values together. Your computer can calculate this term, and multiply it with this term, and multiply it with this term, and that will be the number that is your derivative. And that's all. Wait a second. You now know how to build a neural network. And you now know the training is just, requires you to get these partial derivatives. And chain rule will allow you to get partial derivatives no matter how big your network ends up. You guys could both build a neural network and you know, if you really needed to, you could sit down and you could implement how we could do the training. The training would use, use gradient ascent. You'd have 820 parameters. And you now have equations that you could use to calculate the derivatives of each of those 820 parameters at any one point. And that's it. You guys got it. Now, of course, I said the positioning for today's lecture should just be high level. I want you guys to see the details so that you can appreciate the big picture. This isn't magic. Chain rule really is the answer to where all this deep learning intelligence is coming from. What a powerful tool and allows us to do intelligence with bigger and bigger neural networks. Uh, and so maybe we should just have a moment of silence to appreciate those simple facts. Demystified deep learning. Okay. Fantastic. <laughs> okay. Um, so just to be clear, what would you do if we had multiple hidden layers? You would just do more chain rule. Like if you want to have the derivative with respect to these thetas, then you have the derivative of loss with respect to y. Respect of y with respect to h2, the derivative of h2 with respect to h1, and derivative of h1 with respect to the thetas. Uh, you could just keep adding chain rules uh, to go deeper and deeper in your neural networks. Okay, now it's time to do a little bit of fun uh, exploration. You know, these neural networks, there's this great little demo site that I've got here, and it shows neural networks trying to learn more complicated functions than logistic regression could learn. Someone asked what's the theory behind neural networks, and people would come up with these things where you have like, every point has an x1, x2 coordinate, and then a label either red for zero or green for one. And a neural network can learn a circle. So if all of your ones are in the circle of this grid and all your x's are on the outside, a neural network could learn the circle. You know, spatially, a neural network could learn a spiral. People got deeper and deeper into asking, what can a neural network learn? And now we feel that a neural network could learn any function of any complexity. Like there's no function that's not complicated enough that if I got infinite neural networks, hey, come on, learn. Sometimes they get stuck, 
But you know, you can imagine my step size is a little small here. Oh yeah, I got over the plateau. Keep going, yes, yes, yes. Train, neural network train. <laughs> Do your chain rule. Okay, now my neural network is able to make good predictions. But um, you know, people got deeper and deeper into this, and as I said, we now think that if you put enough neurons together, there is no function that you couldn't learn if you were able to set all the parameters perfectly. There's a couple things that I want to add as extra ideas. One of the extra ideas is we've been talking about binary predictions, but obviously that hand drawing digit one wanted us to make not just binary predictions, but they want to make us predictions that were more multinomial. So like you predicted zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. We aren't going to push you in that direction yet, but if you wanted to, instead of using a sigmoid, you use a version of sigmoid called softmax, and then your loss function would be the probability mass function of a multinomial, not the probability mass function of a Bernoulli. We saw in the hand drawing digit that not all layers were fully connected. You know, at the end we had these fully connected ones, but earlier on we had these boxes, and those boxes were actually sharing weights, and sharing weights is a great idea that people call convolution. Um, and it turns out if you want to do images, having convolution in the first couple layers just makes for some nice, well-trainable uh, neural networks. Here's a crazy thing. People, when they were first starting to understand neural networks, somebody made this crazy neural network where you would put in a face and would predict whose face it was. And they started to put in lots and lots of faces into this. And when they did this, the craziest thing happened. They looked at what was learned in the first layer, and they looked at what was learned in the middle layer, and they looked at what was learned in the later layers, and they saw something incredible. When they looked at what each neuron in the first layer was doing, they learned to do these things that look like edge detectors. And when they looked at what was happening in the middle layer, these neurons would be most activated when they saw things that looked like parts of faces, like one neuron would be looking for a nose, one neuron would be looking for an eye, and when they looked at later neurons, they'd be looking for like ghost faces, like each one of these neurons would be most activated by a face that looked like this picture. You know what's insane about that? If you, people look at human brains, when they look at human brains, the first part of your visual cortex is called the V1 cortex, and guess what it looks like? It looks just like that. The first part of our brain does edge detection. If you look deeper into our brain, the next chunk of brain does things like finding parts. And then eventually we get to higher level concepts like who are we seeing in this. So a neural network with the mechanism I just told you, when it was trained on data without being told how a human brain worked, replicated some of these key properties. Insane. And at that point people were like, whoa, Turing Awards for all of you guys. <laughs> um, obviously neural networks have one, many more than 820 neurons. In fact, you know, there's this Google brain network which does visual recognition, and this is certainly outdated, but a few years ago it had a trillion uh, neurons. And when you looked at those trillion neurons, they'd be you know, 22 layers deep, and somebody architected each of these layers uh, painstakingly. But at the very, 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 very end, it's still producing a probability of different class labels. They trained it on a whole bunch of things. They also trained it on like all frames from YouTube videos. So it got super into cats, which is just hilarious. Um, anyways, <laughs> if you looked at the different neurons that this trillion parameter neural network learned, they had semantic meanings. Like you could look at the best stimulus and you'd be like, okay, here's a neuron and this is really looking for things that are diagonal. But here's a neuron, it's looking for these circular grids. But later on you'd have like, there's the duck neuron, there's the flower neuron, uh, there's the knife neuron and stuff like that. There's this really hard test. It says, I'm going to give you an image from 22,000 categories and you have to figure out which category is in. It was created by our own Fei Fei Li and these categories are pretty specific. You could get a picture of a stingray or you get a picture of a manta ray and you'd have to be able to tell the difference between those two. If you were to random guess, you would do awful at this task. You know, there's 22,000 classes. Before neural networks, people spent a lot of time trying to get really good at this, and they got to about 1.5% accuracy. And people got papers off of 1.5% accuracy. And at some point, people started using neural networks for this. And they started to get closer to like 44% accuracy. You know, humans can get close to 93% accuracy, and the most uh, up-to-date neural networks can outperform humans on this task. And we kind of know this. Um, how many parameters is too many? It turns out if you have enough data and you have enough computer power, the scary thing is it doesn't seem like there is a limit here. We're in this really weird world where if you throw more compute power that can do more gradient descent and you have more parameters, you have more data, 
there doesn't seem to be a ceiling. The models just seem to get smarter and smarter. And that's why there's such a weird arms race going on between like Google and GPT-3 and all these folks to make the best neural network. Um, I'm gonna talk about this more on Friday. Um, and I, yeah, I'll, I'll bring this up too. I do wanna lightly note that not everything's classification. And I would like to leave on this note of this little critter we had training from the beginning of class. Do you guys wanna go check in on our critter? Ah, oh, there's our critter. Here's our critter, and this critter has now gotten pretty smart. Like the critter has now figured out, okay, I wanna go and I wanna re eat all the red dots without eating all the green dots. How does this critter work? You can look at this critter's neural network. What's its inputs? It has all these lines and it knows the distance and a color of what it sees. Based on those inputs, it then has a whole neural network, but then it has a very final output and that very final output doesn't look like it's predicting a one or zero, does it? It's predicting an action to take. One of the actions is move left. One of the actions is move right. One of the actions is move really far left. And one of the actions move really far right. And one of the actions is move forward. Uh, and so at the very end, it's just predicting which of these actions it should take. Its loss function, you know, the thing that was optimizing was based off of looking at its experience and saying, hmm, was I getting good food to eat or not? What a time to be alive. You know, this is just the start. We can talk a little bit more about how far this has gone, but you guys have understood that full picture. Like this simple idea of putting logistic regressions on top of each other, that's what's behind algorithms that can make decisions. That's what's behind these algorithms that can draw pictures. That's what's behind, you know, the self-driving cars. It all comes to logistic regressions put together, trains by chain rule. What a crazy world we live in. Have a fantastic day. Come back on Friday. We'll talk about ethics and fairness uh, before our very final week of school. Have a great day, CS109. Oh, if you ask a question, come get a Mandarin out front.